Hello, one and all, and welcome to the podcast. We call it the Fantastical with myself, Steve Nussbaum. In the podcast, I invite my guests to come on, talk to me all about their musical taste, their memories, their experiences, and they get to collect their fancy festivals, which I have christened Fantastivals. I hope everyone is well, and thank you to everyone for all your kind words about the return of the podcast. We came back with episode 151 last week. That was great. Had Rick McMurray from Ash, an amazing band, a great guest, like I said, got a great reaction. So if you've not gone back and heard the episode, please go back and do so. Great lineup. And Rick was a fantastic fellow. And also a massive thank you to Ian Key for having me on his Indie Brunch show on Louder Than War Radio. An honour to be asked and great fun. And if you've listened to that, I hope you found out a bit more about myself and the thinking behind the podcast. But it's enough about bigging myself up. No one's here for that. You're all here to listen to my guest this week. So time to introduce him on the 152nd episode. I'm delighted to have singer, songwriter from the farm, ladies and gentlemen, it's Mr. Peter Hooten. Okay. Peter, welcome to the podcast. Delighted to have you on at what is a really exciting time for the farm. Looking forward to hearing you talk all about them, past and present. But before we do, yeah. always like to check in with my guests, make sure they're doing well from a mental health perspective. I think it's really important to ask people how they're doing, how they're feeling. So, Peter, mate, how are you? Yeah, yeah, I'm feeling great. Yeah, I'm feeling great. I'm, uh, I've decided I'm not on a, I'm not on a dry January as such, but I just haven't been drinking mainly because of me many football matches that I've been able to go to. So that's the time of drink, really. And obviously, it's not the festival season. In festival season, obviously, uh, we're pretty busy every weekend, you know. Mm. But um, yeah, so I'm fine. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for asking. Always a pleasure. Always interested to hear how people are doing. So, Peter, obviously known as songwriter, singer from the farm, but let's go a bit back before then. So, tell me about your kind of your earliest musical memories. Earliest musical memories were probably family get-togethers, you know, because uh, coming from Liverpool, there was always parties going on at weekends and Christmas and whatever celebrations, and it was a family where people used to have to sing, you know, the adults mainly, but. You know, I, I plucked up the courage once to sing um, somewhere from West Side Story, which was one of me uh, here, <laughs> one of my films at the time that I was into. And none of the other kids did it. They probably thought, oh, "What's he doing trying to sing?" You know, but all the adults were singing, so everyone had to. You know, they went round the room basically. It was almost like in a in a circle, and people, your turn next. You know, and some of the songs they were singing, I've never heard them before or since. But they were brilliant. You know. And the uh, old, oldie worldy songs, you know, but I sang presumably what was a fairly new song at the time somewhere. I think it's a brilliant song still, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And did that kind of give you the singing bug or were there other kind of musical things that you tried first before the singing? Not really. I mean, I was, my mum used to say that I was in the back of a uh, church uh, quite a lot singing uh, singing songs and the priest used to have to tell me, Shh, tell me mum, can you keep your Peter quietly? <laughs> so that was probably when I was like two or three, you know, but I can't remember that obviously, but my mum said, oh yeah, the priest used to get annoyed that he used to sing in the back of the church and uh, disrupted his mass, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so a long way, I guess, from the back of the church to the stage with the farms. I guess uh, with your musical trajectory, was it always a kind of plan for you? Did you always feel like the future was held for you in music? Is that where you wanted to go from a career not, path? Not really, of course. Everyone wanted to be a footballer, didn't they? <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I obviously was, I was very interested in music. And, you know, my dad was a big music fan. He had loads of 78s, you know, those big... Funky 78s, and it was all like, you know, uh, and, but I remember remember in the 60s growing up, we had a Kinks album, you know, Well Respected Man, I think it was, and I, I never had it off the turntable. And I remember that sound of you, you really got me, the guitar sound on that, which ended up like a Sex Pistols sound, you know. I just used to love the sound of that. And obviously, being brought up in the 60s, and you're thinking, you know, the Beatles were the, the dominant group, but I only ever ever really heard their singles, you know, uh, on the radio in the background. But I think it was groups like the Kinks, you know. But it was when I got to in, into the seventies, it was obviously uh, uh, Bowie, you know. You know that that changed everything, didn't it? When you saw him on top of the pops and going, "What's this?" You know, and lots of people say that moment, Starman, I think it was. Yeah. Which, funnily enough, uh, was based on. The Wizard of Oz, wasn't it? You know, we're talking about uh, musicals and films. You know, it was based on The Wizard of Oz. You know, 
and that was based on that song somewhere oh star man you can hear it yeah and it was, i think i think he he waited till it was out of copyright <laughs> to actually say that's where it was influenced <laughs> from you know because <laughs> everything's derivative at the end of the day isn't it you know but but i think yeah i was very interested in me i got into like you know i was into all sorts of music growing up i was into alex harvey i don't know if you've ever heard of yeah. him but you know some brilliant songs you know and uh then I dabbled with a bit of Genesis because there was two tribes in our school. It was the Smoothies and the Trogs, you know. And I wasn't in any. I wasn't in any. Uh, I wasn't. In, I was in between. <laughs> <laughs> so I liked some of the progressive rock stuff. You know, people were bringing in uh, King Crimson and Genesis and Yes and all that. But I didn't like some of it, you know. But I liked Genesis. I liked Gabriel. And I look. I become obsessed a bit with Pete Gabriel, you know. And in a way, still am. Because as soon as he left Genesis, I didn't want to listen to another song by the Phil Collins Genesis. You know, it was always Lamb Lies Down on Broadway and that type of thing. But I think it was, you know, it was really uh, uh, Bowie, you know, and uh, and that that genre. And then obviously with punk rock coming along, they were the forerunners of punk rock, really. And if you listen, I always remember listening to Sweet, the sweet guitar sound, you know, they were absolutely brilliant. I mean, they were regarded as teeny boppers at the time, but when we were growing up, I used to think, you know, some of the guitar sounds on there, it ended up, you know, Steve Jones-style guitar sound on the Sex Pistols, you know. Um, Slade were massive in our school. I mean, I, I didn't particularly... I mean, I like some of Slade stuff, but um, Status Quo were fairly big with pile driver and songs like that, but it wasn't until the likes of Cockney Rebel came along and Cockney Rebel were obviously influenced by uh, Bowie, you know, so it was like one of those situations where it's an influence of an influence. And I thought Cockney Rebel were brilliant. And, you know, I bought their albums, you know. They had some great singles as well, Judy T, you know, and, and, and singles like that. But So it was like everyone in our school was always trying to discover the new thing, you know. It was like, it was a very, that was the way it was. It was like almost like a competition, you know. So you'd had everyone in the common room listening to Pink Floyd, you know, which was in the charts for like so many weeks, wasn't it? Still has been, hasn't it? You know, uh, Dark Side of the Moon, you know, yeah. but there were other people looking for different genres of music. And I was, li it's, I mean, I love soul music as well, which obviously the Trogs didn't like, <laughs> you know, because people had short hair and skinheads and suede heads and smoothies were into soul. But I, I liked it all. You know, if it was a good song, I liked it. Yeah, I was very influenced by various groups. There was a great group called Family. I don't know if you've ever heard of them, but that was a very blues-influenced uh, group, and uh, Roger Chapman was their singer. One of the great blues artists of uh, of this country. You never hear about him now, you know, but he's massive in Germany still, I believe. But, you know, in this country, you never hear Family on the uh, on the radio or anything like that, you know. So it was, a, it was a mixture, but it wasn't really until, you know, I heard the first uh, Clash album, that, you know, I, I rejected everything. <laughs> it was years ago, you, know, you know. That was the moment. Yeah, I think it was. You know, I mean, the, the being the Ramones, hadn't it? And, you know, I loved the Ramones. But, I mean, the, the Ramones were like, uh, you know, they were American, so I couldn't really identify with them as such, you know. They had long hair, you know. Mm. But it was when the Clash come along, you just knew what they were about. And then, of course, the jam, I mean, uh, even though they were regarded by punks, you know, they were a bit snobbish about the jam. I mean, the jam, for me, crossed over from not just the music press, but into the council estates and to the working class of the country. And I think that was the first group who were like, uh, all sorts of different genres would like, you know. And in terms of taking all your those influences then and putting it into your own band, so were The Farm your first band? Because I know you formed The Farm, but were they the first band you were in or did you take a few other bands? No, first? I was it. I was in like a, a jokey school band, hmm. the forerunners to Half Man, Half Biscuit, because uh, the lad who used to write the songs, all the songs were about the sugar shortage and power cuts and all that, you know. <laughs> it was all quite funny stuff, but I was the bass player in that, but I was a bit like Sid Vicious. I couldn't play, you know, and I just pretended to go along. I could do the bass line of Radar Love and, <laughs> and uh, tracks like that and maybe Smoke on the Water by deep people that everyone learns first yeah. of all but um it wasn't it wasn't an ambition to be in a group but just because some of my mates joined the group i decided uh, to join this you know they asked me if i'd play bass probably thought we, we haven't got a bass player let 
get Huto to play the bass, you know. <laughs> but I wasn't the songwriter, you see. I was I wasn't the dominant character in that. And so really I didn't you know, I didn't write the songs or but it was until we used to rehearse in um, in dinner time, you know, in the school hall until one of the teachers heard the lyrics to the songs, you know, and we got we got swiftly banned because the lyrics were about teachers, a lot of them, you know, and what teachers had uh, got up to, you know. And uh, I mean, it was a, one of the songs was, uh, and the group were called Breakwind, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> but one good. of the songs was uh, Table Tennis, and all it went like Table Tennis, Table, Table Tennis, uh huh, Table Tennis. It just went on like that for two minutes, but it'd been banned, you see. The, the school had banned it in dinner hour. Because there was too many arguments over the table tennis, so it was just like a blues song for table tennis, repeated for two or three minutes. You know, genius. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess to some Pete, the farm may have looked like an overnight success, but it was anything but right. It took a, it took yeah. years to get to where the farm the farm got to, and along the way we had Stepping Stone, which yeah. was I guess was the first a like, big hit. From the farm, it was the first big. It was the first record that you know captured the imagination, mm. broadcasters and journalists. But we'd had a song out in the mid eighties called "Hearts and Minds," which had been produced by Suggs. You know, we, and um, we did that in his Liquidator studio in Caledonian Road in London, and he paid for everything. It was just about the time where Madness were nearly splitting up, but they had big deals from record companies where they could start their own um, recording studio. You know. And then in 87, we toured with the House Martins, uh, and then Paul Heaton and Stan Collymore produced us. They were going to set up a label called Fair Play Committee, uh, which was a subsidiary of Polydor, and we were going to be the first signing. But all, all of something came along that it didn't happen. I think Stan Collymore went off to the Hebrides to write children's books. So the House Martins split, so the deal went. So it wasn't until about 1989 where we got our act together a bit, you know. Yeah, and started I, I was listening. What, what we what we'd always wanted to be is we'd seen Big Audio Dynamite in Liverpool in '86, and we'd be using drum loops and samples from spaghetti westerns and that type of thing. And we were always obsessed with that. That's the that's the future sound, you know. That's the future sound. That's what we want, you know. But in those days, it was quite expensive to buy uh, samplers, you know. So we had to wait until we could afford to buy a sampler. And then we started using and experimenting with drum loops. Uh, and then we got in touch with Terry Farley, who was a DJ in London in 89. And he said, oh, I'll produce, you know, I'll help you out. Uh, and then we asked Suggs as well. So Suggs and Terry Farley were instrumental in producing um, Spartacus, basically. But Stepping Stone was the first track, even though it wasn't on Spartacus. Mm. It was the first track that got made people aware. I think the first radio play, and it's probably fitting, the first radio play was Anne, Anne Nightingale on a Sunday night. Oh, wow. She played it, yeah, you know, and uh, God rest her soul. Mm. Uh, she played it on Sunday night and said, wow, you know, that's that's a great version of, of uh, Stepping Stone. And we did Stepping Stone because obviously it was uh, a track that had been done by lots of bands, and including the Sex Pistols. But we we wanted it to be something which was a contemporary sound, which would go down well in, t- in, in uh, clubs, you know. And... I guess before Spartacus slightly, you went to Ibiza, right? You had two weeks in Ibiza and yeah. part of the documentary, a short film about chilling. Like when Keith was yeah. talking about this, he had very fond memories of, uh, yeah, of back in the day. it was an incredible time. You know, it was an incredible time because, you know, we didn't know what to expect, really. Uh, lots of bands were offered it. And when everyone was saying, how much how much are we getting paid? <laughs> and there was no money. <laughs> <laughs> lots of bands disappeared. But a few bands stayed on, and uh, we were one of them. 808 State was another, and a man uh, called Gerald, uh, a man called Adam, a man called Adam was another one. So there's two or three bands went in the end, you know, and it was great publicity for the group. And our manager, it was Malcolm McLaren esque, he was already working for Channel 4, but he didn't tell them he was helping us out in management. So when, he, when it got commissioned by Channel 4, it was like a, it was like a documentary for the farm, <laughs> so it was, it, you just couldn't better that, you know. And uh, we used some of the some of the footage for Groovy Train, and in fact, Groovy Train came out the weekend mm. that it was broadcast on uh, Channel Four, you know. Amazing timing, and then that get, got you on top of the pops, right? And then that, back in those back, back in the day, a top of the pops appearance was worth its weight in gold. 
about unbelievable, you know, unbelievable times. And ex- immediately after our top of the pop performance, our manager said, uh, that's it, I'm resigning now. <laughs> said, what, what are you doing? What do you mean? He went, oh, I'm resigning. Why? He said, well, the, the plan was six months to get you on top of the pops. I've done it. Because <laughs> he wanted to go into writing the, you know, that was his, you know, true ro- love, really, you know, and he ended up being caught, uh, being, you know, a celebrated author. Yeah, made a made a great career out of it, Kevin Sampson, didn't he? I, I yeah, remember reading yeah, Powder, he did, a great book. He did that um, drama documentary about Anne Williams and also the uh, In Search of Round Moat. So he's, he's had two screen plays in the last 18 months, you know, but that was his true love, really. But we didn't want to lose him because mm. he'd been coming up with a lot of the ideas, you know. And you mentioned the Spartacus album earlier. That did get to number one. I mean, did, did, did you have any? You obviously had a head of steam going into that, but did you have any idea how successful that would be at the time? No, I think when we were recording Groovy Train and then we did All Together Now, and that was the autumn of nineteen ninety, and we had a we had an inkling that you know a lot lots of uh, magazines were saying we want you on the front cover. And we said, oh well, the enemy want us on the front cover. No, forget about them. We're the melody maker. We're not seeing. <laughs> oh, but, and so basically, we knew then. You know, the, uh, there was lots of interest, and the face was saying they wanted to do a face front cover of the of me, you know, and and the farm's uh, journey to success. And I think it was in February that came out, February '91, uh, me on the front cover, and it said, you know, how to succeed in the music business. But a lot of it was by chance and luck, and also we had some money behind us as well. So it was, a, you know, it was a jigsaw really. It wasn't just one thing, but I think the very fact that we had records like. Stepping Stone, Groovy Train, all together now. And I think they stand the, st- the test of time. But Spartacus, at the time, we were thinking, we've got a good chance of being number one. But we were a totally independent label. Mm. And we were uh, distributed by an independent pinnacle. And it was very, they were saying, it's almost impossible to get an independent distributor to get to number one. Because you're dealing with the majors and they've got all sorts of deals with the record shops. Well, I don't know how we did it, and we did it, you know. Well, it was like I think it was based upon, you know, uh, supply and demand. It was, and it was genuine, you know, and uh, it was fantastic. We didn't really have time to celebrate because we were on tour, uh, and I've just seen Shed Seven going to number one, you know, and obviously made up for them. Uh, I didn't realise they'd never had a number one, but it's all that hard work coming yeah. to fruition, and that when you see that, you just want to be quiet, really. You don't want to be opening bottles of champagne and. From, front of people's faces you just want a quiet moment of reflection really going you know oh my god how did this happen you know i guess i can't have you on the podcast and not talk about all together now so obviously a huge song still huge now wherever you hear it people sing along to it wherever you are i find i mean what are your memories from writing that did you know when that was written that what you would hit upon not particularly because it was originated from an earlier song called no man's land you know which was more like when we were trying to be like, you know, the jam, you know, and it was a lot faster and punkier. Uh, and then Terry Farley heard it and said, uh, slow it down and put this drum beat, this drum, these drums under it, you know. And and our guitarist, Steve, had always wanted to use Packerbell's Cannon, which he called the sheep advert because it was the wool advert on the telly. But also because he's obsessed with Brian Eno. And Eno had used Packerbell's Cannon quite a lot in various guises, you know. So we used that as the template for it. So when we used Packerbell's Cannon, slowed the track down and the words fitted, we just needed a chorus then. And uh, after Ibiza, uh, the, that chorus just came all together now because it was like in Ibiza, it was like the United Nations, you know, <clears throat> all sorts of different colours and creeds and nationalities, all with the same love of music. Amazing song. I think when I had Keith on the podcast, he spoke about kind of, the, the, not the difficulty, but the decision you made letting Everton use it for their 95 Cup final, right? So you mentioned football a couple of times and you're a Liverpool yeah. supporter. Keith yeah. is an Everton <clears throat> supporter and they wanted to yeah, use it's, use it's it in the 95. Fault. It was Keith's fault, yeah. <laughs> oh, Keith's fault, <laughs> yeah. Well, well, it was just emotional blackmail because we'd done <laughs> stuff for Liverpool. And he had his lads, he was two or three at the time, you know, or maybe a bit older, four or five, you know, he said, ah, he's going to meet the players, he's going to go down to Wembley on the coach. Go. It's not because it's Everton, Keith, it's because I don't want them to change the words. The words mean a lot to me. 
And in the end, after two or three weeks, I just gave in, you know. I counselled my dad, and my dad, who was a season ticket holder at Anfield, said, well, if you don't let them use it, it, it'll look as if, you know, you're not giving the hand of friendship in no man's land. <laughs> Very clever. But times have changed over the years, you know what I mean? There's a lot there's a lot of rivalry now between the clubs. It was a lot friendlier in those days. And people still bring it up, oh, why'd you let them use it? But, you know, I, you know, looking back at it, I didn't want them to use it. And in a way, Keith ended up singing on it, you know. We had nothing to do with it. It was done by session musicians in London, you know. And I don't think, if I was given the choice again, in hindsight, I wouldn't have let them use it, you know. But that's only because I don't like them changing the words, mm. not because it's Everton. Yeah, fair shout, fair shout. You mentioned, like, in hindsight, thinking something. I was just going to, my next question was going to be, what would the Peter Hooten of today say to the Peter Hooten from those early 90s days in the farm? If you could go back and, and see your younger self, what would you say to him as Spartacus was about to, to come out? Um, God, I mean, it's hard to say, yeah, it's hard to say. Maybe, uh, maybe, um, I mean, our manager was always saying, you've got to, you know, Peter, you know, you've been to college, you've got a degree, you've got a postgraduate teaching certificate. It doesn't come across like that in in the interviews. But I, I was I was always trying to tell, you know, inform journalists about what our DNA was, you know. Hmm. So when, for example, uh, we took enemy journalists, we take them to uh, Robert Tressel's grave, who wrote the Ragged Childhood Philanthropist, uh, and we take him in the shadow of Walton Prison. And we take the enemy to that, and we take smash hits there as well. But it didn't come across like that. It come across as maybe, I don't know, I think because we had that image of, like, people off a building site or whatever, no one took any any attempt to intellectualise anything seriously. And I think it's a class thing, that. I think that was genuinely a class thing, you know. And I think, you know, it, it's happened, I've seen it happen to a lot, a lot of groups, but in terms of, we had a, we had a brilliant uh, press officer called Pat Harkins, and she was getting us all the front covers and everything, you know. And uh, but she said, "Well, that's what the, that's what the press want. They want stories of Keith, you know, running away from wherever and uh, biting Richard Whiteley on the nose, even though he didn't. That was our manager who done that, <laughs> Richard Whiteley from Countdown. So, uh, but you know, he wanted these sensational stories, you know, because they were getting into the the red tops all the time, you know." And uh, overturning Piers Morgan's car at a stock car rally, you know, and with the combined forces of the farmer madness, you know. So these these were making the red tops, and you know, it was like rock and roll frenzy, you know. So it was very difficult to roll back from that, you know. So I think it would have been the image of the group, really. I think I would have tried to change. I mean, Kevin, our manager, tried to get us to do that. But I'd say, Kevin, you're the ones getting in touch with the red tops, mm putting out press releases, you know, so you can't blame me, you know. Uh, <laughs> anyway, that's the way it was, you know, but I think I think people are surprised that, you know, how, what the farm have gone on to do. Yeah. Makers, directors, you know, uh, authors, you know, and it's not exactly the way it was portrayed. Absolutely, and, and still going strong to this day after, like you said, everyone's been successful in what they've done outside of the farm. They like to say the farm is still going. And in late September, you released the first single in a long time from the farm, Feel the Love, great single, yeah. Pete. Well done to you and the band. Really good, really contemporary sounding single, but still had the same sound as what the farm had, I think. So tell us about yeah. that single then. Tell us about Feel the Love, how that one came about. That came about from Ibiza 1990, believe it or oh, not. No we, met, <laughs> we, played in the, we played in the Coup Club, a really uh, unbelievable club, you know, where people were gyrating everywhere, you know, and... It was just a fantastic night. We played, and some of the footage was used for Groovy Train video. Uh, and then we kept we were coming out of it, and we were going to go back to the uh, the hotel. And we met this uh, chap with a, a miner's helmet on, with the light on. It was, must have been four or five in the morning, and it was Harvey, DJ Harvey. And he said, where do you go? And he said, well, we're going back to the hotel. He said, come the mountain with me. You know, come the mountain with me. And go, what? what mountain? He said, oh, I've got this mountain and there's no electricity, no running water, but there's a, there'll be a great party up there. So that's what we did, you know. And uh, he was, he, when we were up there, you know, we, he was just such a nice person, such an amiable chap, you know, that, you know, it disarmed us. Uh, all our cynicism that we had as a group was just totally evaporated. Because Harvey was like the uh, the Pied Piper, you know. 
of course, on the night, I think our van driver left because he was driving us up this mountain. He goes, I'm not, where, where are we going? <laughs> Five o'clock in the morning. So we're going to a party. And he went, I'm resigning. This is too much. I didn't sign up for this. And he resigned. We had to get someone else to come from Liverpool to come and drive, uh, drive the minibus back with the equipment in. You always flew, like, but the equipment had to go in this bus, you know. <laughs> so congratulations on Feel the Love. Great single. That was yeah. last year. And in... In the next week or so, on Thursday, the 1st of February, you release Let the Music Take Control. So, again, I've only heard yeah. an 11-second sound snippet of that. Sounds yeah. great. Tell us about that one, because I think there's, from what I've read, there's a, there's a story behind that one. Yeah, um, there was a chance meeting between Keith and uh, Rogers and uh, uh, had a bit of a you know a, a chin wag with them, and he started talking about um, guitars, basically, and guitar sounds, you know, and uh, the hit maker that they both used and 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 Keith used that on um Groovy Train All Together Now. And basically now Rogers he called his guitar the hit maker mm. and they were the same guitar. So we went to a couple of rehearsals and Keith started playing like Nile Rogers and we're going, What are you doing? He said, Oh no, I've met Nile Rogers, I've been influenced, I've been listening to his sound and all that, you know. So then we went in the night time, uh, he put us on the guest list. We went to the Liverpool Echo Arena to watch Nile Rogers, and it was like a biblical experience, mm. you know, with people with the lighters in the air, and he was just talking about being getting over his cancer, and how he was lucky to felt lucky to be alive, and that. so then from that, uh, we just I just had this vision of Nile Rogers being a preacher, you know, going, "Don't let the politicians control you, let the music take control," you know, and that was the idea behind the song. So Keith had come up with this riff and also Steve Grimes, who's the uh, songwriter with Keith, they come up with like an R. Rogers meets Kraftwerk riff and I put these lyrics over it that were based upon a preacher, you know, like a preacher man in, a, in, a, in an audience, you know, like a congregation, you know, go let the music take control. And that's the idea behind the song. You know, and it, I got it from when during lockdown, when you had the... Um, Politicians going on platforms with three three word slogans, uh, you know, to yeah. take back control and all this. But I thought, no, let the music take control, you know. Great stuff. I'm sure that will go down really well. Looking forward to to seeing that get released and all the positive publicity that surely should get. I mean, you've got a legacy of music, Pete. I mean, do you find it daunting releasing new material? Did you find, I guess, the first experience back in September a bit daunting or nerve wracking at all? Yeah, it was because when we used to release stuff, it was mainly, uh, you know, physical copy, you know, physical copy, you know. So, um, yeah, it was because we didn't, mm. you know, and still, you know, still now uh, streaming for young people, that's that's natural and that. But even to me, I, I you know, I begin, you know, I started to love it actually because you can get anything on Spotify mm. or, or Amazon Music or, you know, the other platforms and the uh, you can just type something in and it comes up and it's great, but unfortunately for the artists, it's not a great royalty off it, you know, so there's a dilemma there, but it's a great platform to promote your music. So uh, promote your music and maybe even release an album, like, you know, we hope to in the future, uh, later on the year, hopefully, you know, we'll have physical copy as well, you know, and uh, so, yeah, you know, it's very daunting at the time. It must be um, quite, quite an exciting time as well. Pete, though, like to to get it out there and to let people hear like the fresh fresh new music from yourselves, and there's a fan base of obviously yeah. still out there listening and wanting to hear it. Yeah, well, there, you know, there was the first time I didn't even know it being playlisted by Radio Two. I know we we didn't have a uh, we had uh, Carl Hunter who was our bass player taking it into Radio Two, and then another la- a lad uh, who was who is a plugger saying, "Oh, I'll help you out as well." But we hadn't employed him at that stage. You know, I got a I got a text off. Uh, one of the biggest promoters in the country going, uh, congratulations. I said, for what? He went, oh, you've been playlisted at Radio 2. And he obviously gets it before it's announced, you mm. see. So, uh, yeah, it was fantastic to hear on the radio. And the number of people who've come up to me since going, oh, really soulful, that you really sounded, you know. So, yeah, it's it's great when you get that type of... It's better than people going, it's a pile of shite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, obviously. What are you doing? Give up. <laughs> And it's not just new music you've got coming out in 2024. There's already some live dates been announced, right? So you've got a few festivals coming up. And on the 27th of Feb, you're, you're playing the concert to fight food poverty at Manchester yeah. Apollo. That seems like a really special gig, that one. Yeah, yeah, it should be good. Yeah, I mean, we the dates we've got at festivals, and we'll probably get some more festivals coming in as well. 
But things like the uh, food poverty one, yeah, we're asked to do that, and it's something close to our hearts, you know, so we get involved in things like that. You know, it's something, I mean, we were heavily involved in the Hillsborough Justice campaign back in the day, and it ended up, we went on tour with Big Audio, well, Big, Mick Jones from The Clash and Big Audio Dynamite. Uh, we call it the Justice Tonight Band, you know. And that wet our appetite in many ways for playing live again, especially when Mick Jones, who's been in probably the greatest rock and roll band ever, in my opinion, starts saying to Keith Mullin, went, yeah, Keith, you're the soul man, man. You're the soul man. You don't play the same thing every night. You play something different every night, but it's still in the parameters of what is, you know. And like Mick Jones on that tour was like, he was the Pied Piper as well. And everywhere we went, groups would join because, you know, in, in Cardiff, it was uh, James Dean Bradfield from the Mannix. In, Ma- in Manchester, it was John Squire and Ian Brown. In Sheffield, it was Richard Hawley and uh, Reverend the Makers. Glasgow, Las Vegas. In London, it was Primal Scream. And members, ex-members of the Clash turned up as well, you know. So it was an unbelievable experience. And in a way, it whet our appetite for playing live again. Because we got pretty disillusioned at one stage with the music industry, the way everyone mm-hmm. does, you know, you get so so many uh, problems that happen, you know. But we just thought, this is we, we've missed doing this, haven't we? You know, and we, we you know... That's what where we decided then to make ourselves available for festivals more, you know. Yeah, and it's great. I've seen lots of clips of you at festivals like Shine On, and it seems like you go de- like you go down to pretty much every live appearance at a festival. People singing along to not only All Together Now but lots yeah. of other tracks as well. That's right. Yeah, you know, and it's I think we for, we forgot. You know, we're mm. you know we're young, a, a, a la- fundamentally we were a live band. You know, we were in a studio band as such. You know. Uh, we were a live band and uh, and we missed it, you know, and I think we all look forward to the festivals. We always find a, a, a decent pub on the way to go to mm-hmm. with, a, with a serving decent food, you know, and we make a day of it. And it's like, you know, old friends, you know, getting together. It's like the deer hunter. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So I guess to come back to your musical taste you mentioned kind of the jam and the clash. Are you in any yeah. other genres that you're into? Are you into kind of that era, or, or what else? What else? What else do you listen to, um, Pete? Well, I was, you know, I, li- I listen to a, a variety of stuff, but I mean, uh, something I always go back to would be the Blue Nile, uh, the Glasgow band. They're yeah. absolutely brilliant. I love them. You know, even though very, uh, you know, they're you know they're not dancey as such, but you know, it's just it's music of the gods, I call it. You know, so also I loved Sly and the Family Stone, Mamas and the Papas, uh, the Beach Boys. Didn't really get into the Grateful Dead, but you know all sorts of classic groups, you know, which you can always go back to. And you know, in terms of uh, of new stuff, I'm listening to stuff all the time. I love uh, a group called Badiga. I don't know if you've heard of them, but I think they're from Brooklyn. I just love the sound. And if I put it on to people, go, oh, it's not never no, heard before. But you know what? You know, it's it's for me. It's a, it's about the quality of the song. You know, it's about the quality of the song. And if it's a, if if, the, if it's a good song. You know, fantastic. But we used to, you know, on the way to festivals, we have like Spotify questions, you know, about who do you think's got the most followers, you know, <laughs> monthly followers. And some of the uh, some of the numbers involved are just astronomical, you know. Uh, you know, Taylor Swift and Ed Sheeran, you just can't even comprehend, comprehend them, you know. Yeah. But I think with the Beatles recently doing uh, Now and Then, or then and now. Is it now and then? Now, it was and, now then. and then. Yeah, now and then. Yeah, you know, with them doing that, I've seen that their monthly Spotify list, you know, listeners have has rocketed up, you know. Uh, so they're only probably about a third of what Taylor Swift's got now, you know, <laughs> because it is a different thing, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's it's hard to say, you know, but I mean, I, I, I love doing, you know, listen to new stuff and putting it, you know, we sometimes put it on the, uh, on our Spotify library, you know. Yeah. Sounds good. So much to consume out there. It's such a great choice and, and easy to find music compared to what it was all those years ago. Let me take you back, Pete, to years ago. Do you remember what your first single was or what your first album was? And do you remember where you bought that? Yeah, that? yeah first single was definitely uh, first single. I mean, my mum and dad bought me Lily the Pink by uh, the Scaffold, <laughs> even though probably wouldn't want to admit it now. But two little boys involved in that sport. The first single I wanted to buy was um, Broken Dream by Python Lee Jackson, which was uh, Rod Stewart as a session singer. 
and that was the first. Uh, and I think probably the first album I went out to buy with my own money. Let's see, it was probably uh, it was probably the Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust. Yeah, that's what it would have been. Yeah, and we used to go around to my mate's house. Yeah, and listen to it and. And, and if he had some cider in, we'd drink some cider. <laughs> and we'd just go, he'd just hear it and go, oh my God, this is unbelievable, you know. And yeah, uh, but then first, one of the first um, albums I remember buying would be Buzzcocks and also XTC albums. Uh, and then, of course, the first Clash album, which I think was 77, I think. And when I heard that, you know, it was just like, you know, obviously I knew of the Sex Pistols, but. You know, to me, it was like controversial stuff and it was like front pages all the time. And for me, it was The Clash was the first punk group that made sense to me. I went to see different other punk groups. I went to see Chelsea. There was a group called Chelsea and a group called Slaughter and the Dogs, you know, and other groups. I went to see Wayne County and the Electric Chairs as well. Have you ever heard that single? You don't want baby, baby, uh, you don't want to fuck me, then baby, baby, fuck off. (laughs) (laughs) I I went to see them in Eric's, you know. But then uh, the undertones, you know, unbelievable concert in Eric's, the ma- madness in Eric's, the sp- and I went to see the specials quite a bit. And then I, I was lucky enough, I went to see the Clash in Paris for seven nights on the run. Wow! Uh, and it, the the lineup was the Clash, the Beat, and Wahid. Uh, so everyone thought I was with Pete Wiley from Liverpool. Uh, but the the Clash's road manager called a fellow called Bob Adcock. And he's on Facebook now, and he's always giving stories about all groups he'd been with. Uh, and I walked in at the Mogador Theatre, it was, in Paris, hoping to get in to see the Sanjek and maybe get a pass or something. And he saw me and he went, are you with Wiley? And I went, no, no, I've just come down. He said, where are you from? I said, Liverpool. Who do you support? Liverpool. He went, you're in. I've got stage passes for the whole seven nights. And... Wow. Uh, I became part of the Clash family. It was unbelievable. And like everything you read about Strummer and Mick Jones, you know, it was it was true. On the last night, uh, we went round Paris and Joe Strummer and Mick Jones said to all the punk wastrels from Paris, come with us, we'll, go, we'll find a bar. And so they went to bars and, and clubs and the first three or four wouldn't let them in. And Joe Strummer, and there was about 60 people. And he said, hey, we're all in or none of us are in. We're the Clash, man, you know. So, anyway, got knocked back from one, got knocked back from the other. Got, got, and eventually, it was, he found a, a bar in the club where he let everyone in. And that was what the Clash were about, doing a people's band. Absolutely. And we always yeah. remembered that as the farm. You know, we always wanted to live up to that um, philosophy. Best way to be. Best way to be. Great band, the Clash. So, Pete, this podcast is about you collating your fancy festival. I know you played many a festival. Are you a big fan of the festivals? Festival format? Uh, yeah, I am now. I mean, I wouldn't wouldn't have been in during my punk rock days, you know. <laughs> but yeah, I am now. Yeah, definitely. Because if you'd see the way they're organised now, and you know, some fantastic festivals out there, you know, and we played quite a few of them, you know, and you really are. Um, you, you get a selection of music on the day. The one thing is about most of them is that the groups, have, you know, the groups have been playing so long that you know they're chosen because the the promoters know they're going to go down well at a festival, you know? Absolutely. So like I said, at the start of the podcast, the aim of this is getting our guests to collate their fancy festivals so they get to choose any five acts, one of whom must play one of their studio albums in full and an encore, which could be any song which all five acts can perform together to end the fantasy festival. So Pete has the pleasure of doing that this evening. So for any first-time listeners, very easy, five acts, Five time slots. So, like I said at the beginning, I had Rick McMurray on from Ash in our last episode. Yeah, and he. Uh, I've seen Ash. I've seen Ash at a festival. Great. We played with them a few years ago, and they were absolutely brilliant. Yeah, absolutely different class. I bet they were. He was brilliant on the podcast. Such a lovely guy as well. He was on last week. He created his Fuzz Worship Fantasy Festival. He held it in a graveyard in a church near his house. In his opening act, he had The Breeders, Super Seconds, he picked Nick Drake, Midway Madness, he picked Soundgarden, pre-headline slot, he picked Faith No More, and for his headline act, he picked Black Sabbath, but only to play songs from their first five albums before 1975, (coughs) and for his encore, he had them all playing Clones all together, which is a song by Ash, so that's for Um, how simple it is for any first-time listeners. But before you get to pick your acts, Peter, you've got to give your fantasy festival name, 
and give it a venue. So, Peter, what are you going to call your fantasy festival? Uh, oh, God. Uh, innocent Bystanders. Innocent Bystanders. All right. I like that one. And you can hold it anywhere. You can hold it in your beloved Anfield. You can take us back to Ibiza. You can take us anywhere you want to go. We will follow you. Big, small, far, not far. We'll hold it wherever you want. So where would you want to hold your fantasy festival? Uh, I'd, I'd hold it in Stanley Park in between both football grounds. But this time I'd be I'd be hoping we get a, um, a licence for alcohol. All right. We played it about uh, several years ago and the council wouldn't uh, save alcohol. Oh, really? <laughs> I don't know whether they thought it was because of our reputation or, or whatever, but it was the only festival I've ever been to where people had to go to the pub and bring pints back. You know? <laughs> Well, your fantasy festival, Stanley Park for this one's got its alcohol license. It's all going to happen at Innocent Bystanders. Yeah. So before you go through your five acts, Pete, any acts you want to mention who you love, but just aren't making it in to your Innocent Bystanders fantasy festival? Yeah, uh, it has to be the specials, Madness, the Jam and the Clash, simply because I've seen them so many times that, you know, as a fantasy festival, I want to see, I want to have... My fantasy festival artists I haven't really seen that much, you know. Okay. All right, some big acts missing so out that, there. Yeah, so yeah, definitely those those groups and uh, and the undertones as well. We can forget the undertones. Buzzcocks, of course, you know. There's a whole variety I could I could list, you know. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So I saw your Twitter post earlier. I thought the clash might make it on, I thought the jam might make it on as well. So interesting they have well, made it. Where? An hour ago, they were on it. <laughs> <laughs> that's the whole... I love it when people tell me they've had to kind of constantly change their minds. I, I get some kind and of... And I just weird. thought, you know, people know that I love them. You know, so they know well, I'm on a, you know, on other, other, other influences, you know. Absolutely. All right. So it's two o'clock in. Innocent bystanders. Lovely day at Stanley Park. Alcohol license is done. Yeah. Your open act about to take the stage. So, Pete, who's going to open Innocent Bystanders? It's going to be the Blue Nile. Great shout. So you, I guess you spoke about the Blue Nile earlier, but personally for you, why are you having them open in your fantasy festival? Because it's just, the songs are so iconic and they're so, they sound so good and it would me, it'd mellow off the crowd for what's going to come later. So, you know, everyone would be on a great, you'd listen to it and you go, you know, this is music, this is fantastic. You've got to set and it's two o'clock, is it? Yeah, two o'clock, three o'clock, yeah. It's just warming up, you know, the sun's in, in the sky and you listen to that and go, why, and people go, why haven't I heard these before? Why have I not heard these before? These are unbelievable, you know. I think I've only heard of them because I've obviously worked in HMV for a long time, so I know the album covers. I couldn't tell you that many songs, but I'm aware of the albums and how important they are. But, yeah, a band yeah. who, I guess if you know, um, you probably love them, but it's, in the first place, I guess, finding out about them before hearing them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Okay, so Blue Knoll are going to be open at... Maybe surprisingly, yeah. maybe not. First time I've ever, ever been picked for a fantasy festival. So after 152 episodes, the Blue Nile are added to our fantasy festival roster. Oh, brilliant. So, yeah, you've got them on there. They're going to play from two till three. We'll take a half-hour break. Then it'll be time for your super seconds act, Pete. Who are you going to have uh, play from yeah. half-past three to half-four for us? It's, uh, I mean, it's got to be Talking Heads. Talking Heads. Talking Heads. You know, unfortunately, I never saw them, but I would have loved to have seen them, you know, and... I, mean, I was thinking of uh, I was thinking of sparks, you know, and something off the wall like that. But then I thought, no, talking heads. I want to hear talking heads in the Innocent Bystanders Festival in Stanley Park, and you know, just one of those groups that's you know timeless. Absolutely, timeless. Are. absolutely. Are. I think the 40th anniversary of um, Stop Making Sense is about to happen, and there's a big tribute album coming out with some big yeah. old bands from Paramore, the first act who have been announced on that. I think that's going to be really good to kind of bring that concert back into the main four i guess of media after 40 yeah. years i mean they only get an hour any songs they're gonna to have to play in the hour because now is quite a short time for them anything you'd have to hear within that hour yeah it's slippery people would have to on there wouldn't it absolutely all right great shout talking heads are playing they make their fifth appearance at a fantasy festival this is the earliest anyone's ever put them on so loving your style Pete. super seconds talking heads gonna play from half past three to half past four we'll take a half hour break, then that'll take us to our midway madness slot from five till six. So two acts down, three to go, Pete. Who are you going to have in your midway madness slot? Mid midway madness. Well, I was thinking. I mean, you know, there's so many artists that I was thinking of this. I was thinking of Marvin Gaye. 
to chill the crowd out again. I was thinking of Bob Marley, but then Keith chose them. Keith chose Bob Marley, didn't he? So I thought to get the crowd up again, Stevie Wonder. Oh, great shout with Stevie Mm -hmm. Wonder. Great shout. And again, I guess Stevie Wonder could play for an entire day by himself, but he's only getting an hour. So I'll ask you again, (laughs) what... What is there an era of Stevie Wonder you would want, or any s- song specifically you want by Stevie Wonder? Well, you know, was, you know the, I think it'd be his uh, the period, early seventies period. Yeah. All right. So, I mean, obviously everyone will pick, pick Superstition, won't they? But uh, I'd, I'd want to hear songs in the key of life, you know, the album, maybe. Yeah. All right. We can do that. Stevie Wonder making his six fantasy festival. Appearance. We're going to play from five till six. Again, the fairly short set from Stevie Wonder, but going to be amazing. So, a brilliant first three acts for your Fantasy Festival, Pete. We've got two left to go, so we'll take another half hour break. And it'll be time for your pre headline act. We're going to play from half past six to eight o'clock. So, Pete, who's going to be your pre headline act at Innocent Bystanders? I mean, you know, how can you, how can you be a support band, but it's got to be, uh, it's got to be Bowie. Bowie. All right, all right. So, Barry, you mentioned how important, I guess, the rise and fall of Siggy Stardust is, I guess, on this podcast a bit earlier. But again, yeah. anything in particular from Barry? Again, Barry could do his whole day. I'd love, I'd love to hear V2 Schneider, but I'd also love to hear his, his, let's, his let's dance period as well. So not just all the classics, Gene Genie, Starman and all them, but, you know, and and it also some of the stuff from um, the album he, he released before he passed away, you know, some great stuff on that, you know. Yeah, some but, um, amazing stuff. But yeah, you know, I think yeah, I mean, it's sound and vision, you know. That I'd have to be on it, wouldn't it? Uh, how, how long's he got? He got an hour and a half. An hour and a half, yeah. So you could get you could get a good fifteen tracks in there, couldn't you? you know? Yeah. Absolutely. All right. David Barry is your pre headline act. This is the 18th time he's been picked. He's the most popular pick on the Fantastical podcast. Oh, yeah. And deservedly so, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I never saw him, but I saw I saw the spiders from Mars after he left. <laughs> <laughs> That's Close enough. You know. Close enough. Oh, you never saw Barry then? No. No. Never, ever. Okay. Bit of a shame, you know, but. Yeah. All right, well, he's playing your fantasy festival, so he gives us an hour and a half. He'll play to eight o'clock. One more break, and it'll be time for your headline act. We're going to play from half past eight till eleven. So, Pete, who's going to be your headline act? Well, as I say before, I had it down as the Clash. Then I changed it to the Who because I've never I've never seen the Who really, you know. And then I just thought, well, how can you be in Stanley Park, <laughs> the innocent bystanders, without having uh, the Beatles on? Fair shout. Fair shout. So, you know, I want to hear Tomorrow Never Knows at their height, you know. They're not, obviously, they never played it live, did they? Well, they only played it in Shea Stadium, you know, but um, or on the 66 tour, but I'm not too sure. You'd have to get a Beatles expert to uh, talk about that. But, I mean, there's so many genres they could they could uh, cross over, you know. from the You know, they went from She Loves You, didn't they, to... Um, oh, amazing, yeah. She, she Loves You to like 18, two years later, to uh, Revolver. So I'd like to hear most of Revolver, little bits of um, little bits of other albums, but mm, they, you know, the, the basis of it was Revolver. And I got into Revolver after Paul Weller said, uh, after releasing a jam album, he said, if you think, if you like this, go and listen to Revolver. So I did, with the lights out, and I heard it, and I just thought, oh my God. <laughs> It all makes sense now because I've never heard Beatles albums as such, you know. Mm. And when you play Revolver in the dark, it's unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've not had Paul Weller on the podcast. Whether he ever comes on or not, who knows? But I think if he ever does, I think the Beatles would be his headline act based on what I've read about his love of the Beatles. I think he's a massive, massive Beatles fan, a huge Beatles fan. Yeah, he is, him. you know. And how could you not have them in Liverpool and Stanley Park? It'd be, it was your fantasy. Well, you yeah. know, you've got to have the Beatles. And I'm also chair of the Beatles legacy group in Liverpool. <laughs> so I could not ignore the Beatles, you know. Yeah, I think there'd be a, you'd, you'd come back to a mini riot if you didn't put the Beatles on there. All right, so Beatles making their 10th Fantasy Festival appearance. They're your headline act. And at 11 o'clock, they're going to be back on stage. Your stage now will consist of the Beatles, David Burry, Stevie Wonder, Talking Heads and the Blue Nile. And they're looking at you on the side of the stage going, Pete, 
what we're going to play, what do you want us to play to close your fantasy festival? So you get to give them one song to play together to end their fantasy festival. So what are you going to have them play, Pete? I mean, it's, I'd say all together now, wouldn't I? But, I mean, really... It's you can do. Be, you absolutely all can you do. Need is, it's got to be all you need is love, isn't it? That's a great shout. Do you know what? As a bonus... I am going to make them play all together now before they play All You Need Is Love. You're getting two encores for a special episode. <laughs> <laughs> so all together now and All You Need Is Love bringing your fantasy festival to a close. So let's lock that one in and get it into the fantastical vault. So your open act, we've got the Blue Nile. I should mention Innocent Bystanders at Stanley Park. Super Seconds, we've got Talking Heads. Midway Madness, we've got Stevie Wonder. Pre-headline act, we've got David Bowie. Headlining, we've got The Beatles and their encore all together now. And all you need is love. Sounds fantastic to me, Pete. You happy to lock that one into our fantastical vaults? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty pleased with that. And you know, obviously, you know, it's some of your favourite bands aren't in there, but it's sure I would, I would have got it the Clash and the Jam and the Specials in the top ten. You know, yeah. But I to pick five, and they, they are so I haven't seen. You see, so that's I've seen um, the Blue Nile. I've seen Paul Buchanan on his own doing Blue Nile stuff, but I haven't seen the Blue Nile. You know, so they're all. Oh, that's a sight I've never actually seen. I, I was toying with the idea of Prince. Oh, good shout. I, I wouldn't know how to bill him. I wouldn't know how to uh, put him on the bill. Is it? Would it be a symbol or would it be print? I don't know. <laughs> Do you know what? Before we started recording, I did go back and look at Keith's lineup, and I thought, I wonder if there'll be any duplicates in there. So Keith did hold his at Stanley Park as well. So maybe Keith, can, maybe Keith can have the Saturday and you get the Sunday, and we do it as like a farm double header. So yeah, Keith had NWA. Hey. Sleaford Mods, Marvin Gaye in his Midway Madness, The Clash as his pre-headliners and had Bob Marley as his headline act. So two stellar lineups there. Two absolutely stellar lineups there. So Yeah, I mean, what a weekend of music that is. <laughs> oh, unbelievable. Unbelievable. I'd, I'd be at Stanley Park in, a, in an absolute heartbeat. That would be incredible. And we forgot Blondie and the Ramones. <laughs> you only get five. If you'd done this lineup tomorrow, it'd be probably completely different because yeah, people... it probably would be. But <laughs> it's got to end on the Beatles. I mean, even though no one could hear them, could they? And yeah, that's yeah. why they stopped playing. <laughs> but the studio band, but you know, when they saved their apprenticeship in Hamburg, they would have been tight. They would have mm-hmm. been really tight, as you know. And people in Liverpool who saw them after they come back from Hamburg were saying, you know, the incredible band. You know, yeah, I bet they were. I bet they were. So. Pete, I guess before we end this one, let's talk about, I guess, the remainder of the year. So we've got a new single coming out on Thursday, the 1st of February, Let Music Take Control, which I'm really looking forward to. You've got some live dates. I guess what else is 2024 holding for yourself and the farm? Yeah, we're going to be going into the studio and finishing off. We've got probably got about six songs completed. So we're going to uh, be recording another four songs, probably hopefully get them uh, recorded. And hopefully, uh, I mean, there's, we've had a few brilliant offers off people who we've mentioned on this podcast now, which I can't name the names now, but, you know, said, I love this new stuff so much, come to my studio to record it, you know. So uh, we might be taking them up on the offer, you know. Brilliant. All right, really exciting times. So if anyone, I imagine anyone follows you anyway, but if someone wants to follow you and doesn't, where can someone find the farm and yourself on social media? Well, there's a website, uh, www w.farmmusic.co.uk I mean I'm on Twitter the farm stroke Peter on Instagram Peter underscore Hooten and on Facebook for some reason I've got two pages on Facebook and I don't know I don't know why <laughs> you know because I started off as a personal uh, Facebook yeah. you, you can, you're only allowed 5,000 whatever followers and you know so I started another page so you get more people because that's Oh, I was so popular. I was so popular. <laughs> yeah, so just put up with... I mean, I'm not that savvy when it comes to social media and that, you know, but I know a little bit about X and Twitter and that, you know, but... Uh, yeah, so have I got the right... Uh, I don't even know I've got the right website. Is that the right website? We'll put we'll put all the links in the episode description. So we think we've got the right website, but if not, scroll down your episode description and, and I guess all the links will be there. But like you said, you can be found on Facebook, Instagram... And Twitter and the farmer got their own website essentially. Yeah, and um, you leave snippets of, of uh, you know the new stuff. I mean, the idea was to release new stuff every few you know every few um, every few weeks, you know. But because Feel the Love did so well mm-hmm. at radio, we've had to delay this one a bit, you know. And hopefully, uh, people won't have forgotten about us. I've just put the farm into 
into Google. I'm just getting all all McDonald's and peaceful farms and all that. Wait a minute. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it's www.thefarmmusic.co.uk. Fantastic. So that is Not it. that I have, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> you will for the next one, for the next podcast you go on, you'll go and check that before you do it to make sure you're covered, I reckon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I'm enjoying everything and, you know, uh, you know, it's it's been great to talk about, uh, you know, influences and fantasy festivals. Great idea. Mate, pleasure having you on. And like I said, big fan of you guys. I think the last single was brilliant. I look forward to hearing the full version of the new single on the 1st of February. I'm sure that will, will get just as much praise, if not more. And I look forward yeah. to obviously catching you at a festival, a live date, I guess, in 2024 and beyond, uh, hopefully. Right. So that is it, everyone. Thanks for listening to the 152nd episode of the Fantastical Podcast. If you've enjoyed this one, please subscribe and give the Fantastical Podcast a review. You can do it on iTunes by giving us five stars or you can follow the show on Spotify and you can also rate the show and you can also comment on the episode. So if you've enjoyed this one, please go and do that. It will be much appreciated. The Farm and Peter are on Twitter. So is the podcast. So give us a follow if you don't already at Fantastical P. We are also on TikTok. So i done my first TikTok video oh, last yeah, week. I forgot about that. We're on TikTok, yeah. Yeah, TikTok <laughs> baffles me. But um, i done my first plugging video and got a fairly decent response to it so i think that's going to be a new thing for us so if you don't follow us or the farm on tiktok make sure you do you can also email us at the podcast at fantastical podcast at outlook.com unfortunately we don't play music on the pod because it would just be far too long but i'll get some tracks from pete we'll get a nice little spotify playlist of all the acts he's spoken about in this episode so scroll down in your episode description and you'll find all the links for the farm there and you'll find the link for this episode playlist so pete like i said 152 done thank you so much been a great guest great to talk to you and like i said wish you all the best in the upcoming weeks and months with the farm okay thanks a lot steve i mean been a pleasure thank you absolutely so i'll be back next week with episode number 153 so please make sure to join me for that one but until then stay safe my fantastical friends please continue to spread the word and that word is fantastical thanks for listening